I figure I put together an Apple Silicon Buyer's Guide for Pro Photographers, so let's find out which one may best fit into your workflow. This is I was right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. If you have watched my M2 Pro and M2 Max video, you may have seen some of these recommendations already. What I've decided to do is put them all together into one video so you can make the best decision in choosing the best Apple Silicon that will fit with your workflow. If you find information that I'm sharing with you helpful, please consider supporting the channel either through a tip jar or YouTube super thanks. All the funding will go and directly support me and running my channel. In addition, I'll also save somebody's funding to purchase future machine to test on my channel as well. Something to note is that I'll be taking a pro perspective on all this, one who does weddings, events, architecture, and also commercial work. So as a pro photographer, I go through a lot of files, a lot of large files on a constant basis, and I need to get these files render, edit, and get them out to my client fast. So I'll be taking that approach. As usual, when it comes to Apple Silicon, there are segmentations or the way how Apple have grouped them. One of them is going to be more consumer leaning. The other one is more pro oriented. So here's the thing. If you're a pro and you use the machine in any pro capacity at all, I would tell you to choose the more pro oriented chip right away because you gain a lot more benefit from it. The machine itself, you generally have more ports on there. You can link them up to more displays. You have more CPU, more GPU in the system that you can use. So there are benefits to going for a pro SOC, especially if you're really doing the pro creative work for revenue. And one additional thought I'd like to share with you about these SOC segmentation, and this has more to do with the machine form factor. The main question here is, do you need a laptop machine? Because if you don't need a laptop machine, you already have a screen and everything. Sometimes getting a desktop machine can really give you a top performance one, such as the Mac Studio with the M1 Ultra, or it can even get you a really great deal, such as the M2 Pro Mac Mini. I mean, those are really fantastic performing machine. No, they don't come with a built-in display. They're not in a form factor that can easily be traveled with and used, but you can easily travel with those computers. They're not too bad at all to really carry on the road with you. So those are some of the factors to think about as well as you're going and choosing the silicon that you may want to use in your workflow. Now with that being said, I've created this chart that really just goes over and try to simplify things based on the creative app that you may be working. And the way how this chart goes is that it goes from good, better, and best depending on the type of task that you're doing. And if you notice one thing on this chart is that there's really no consumer oriented chip on here. If you want to use a consumer one, you can. There's really not a lot of deciding there. You just get the M2 or the M1 for that matter. But when it comes to the more pro oriented one, there are some delineations that we need to make. So if you're running Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, my base recommendation would be to get at least a pro machine. Now, if you can really spring for the max machine, you can gain some benefit of having extra GPU on the system. Lightroom and Lightroom Classic can definitely use the GPU for hardware acceleration on many tasks now, and you do see a time improvement on export and on some other tasks that you're really doing with the system as well. If you want the top performance machine, money is no object, and I would definitely choose the M1 Ultra if you're running Lightroom, Lightroom Classic. And believe me, I have the M1 Ultra, and I absolutely love that machine. Now, when it comes to Photoshop, I've also listed the Pro and also the Max. Now, the reason why for that is because if you just need 32 gigabytes of memory, the Pro will do just fine, or even 16 for that matter. But if you need anything more than that, if you need like, for instance, 64 gigabytes of memory, you have to choose the Max configuration of a ship. Now, if you're just going for 32 and you have the option between the Pro and the Max, it's not really going to make too much of a difference in Photoshop work. But in that situation, what I would do is think about the other apps you're using. Can they benefit from you going to a max and having more GPU in the system? So that's something to think about as well when you're really going and deciding about all these things. Now, the other thing too that I will say is that if you need 128 gigabytes of memory, you have to go to the Ultra and you're really forced to go up that pyramid regardless. So you don't really have a lot of options there if you want more memory in the system. When it comes to Capture One, I listed Max there because you're going to get the best performance out of anything else from the Max ship. And the reason why I recommended this is not that you can go in and upgrade to the top Max ship, you're not going to get much benefit from that. My recommendation from Capture One is just simply choose the base 
M1 or M2 Max SOC, and you're going to do just fine with just getting the most performance you can get out of Capture One. Now, choosing the Max here will benefit Photoshop and also will benefit Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, should you use those apps as well. And lastly, if you do any type of video work, you will note that the Pro is not even on there at all. And the reason why is because the Max SOC has doubled the encoder decoder engine that definitely reduced the time exporting, rendering, transcoding files and everything like that. And it comes in really handy. So if you do any type of pro video work, I definitely recommend going with the max and the minimum. And you can also choose to go with ultra as well. Now, if just really using capture one, can you go with ultra? Like you can certainly do that. But if you watch my other videos before, Choosing the Ultra specifically for the Capture One doesn't really gain you that much benefit. In fact, the point of diminishing return is usually somewhere around like the max SOC. So those are just things to think about. Now, as far as RAM on the system go, I always recommend that for pros, go with at least 32 gigabytes of memory. If you don't use it now, in the future you may. And should you run into a situation where you need that extra burst of RAM, well, you have it in your system because there's really no way to upgrade this. As far as SSD go for Pro, I always recommend going with at least one terabyte. But I know that some of us really have to think about the system resources that we're going to upgrade and pay for. And if you can really get away with 512, I would just do that. But I wouldn't necessarily go in and upgrade SSD, especially if you're not going to use it just to gain the higher speed. Because in multiple of my tests already, you can go and watch many of my videos there's maybe only one test and that is the 56 gigabyte Photoshop test that shows variations and the variations are very minor at best. We're talking about a one minute time variation. So it's really not that big of a deal at all. So those are the recommendations I have for the machine. Now, the other thing that I also want to share is that if you already have an Apple Silicon, that graph before was for those of you who have Apple Silicon or if you're coming from Intel, that would be the path that you would choose. But if you already have an Apple Silicon, you're choosing an upgrade path. All of these arrows that I'm sharing with you are valid. The easiest way to use this chart is to just figure out what SOC you currently have. For instance, let's say you currently have the M1 Pro. You have all these directions you can go to. For example, you can jump to the max, you'll get the top performance. You can also linearly upgrade to the max as well. Now that the prices drop down because the M2 Pro, M2 Max have been released, that's also a good contender for upgrading. You can also choose to upgrade to the next generation too, but I just want to share with you that that's not always necessary. Now, let's say if you get the max and you want the top performance still, I mean, all graphs right now still leads back to the M1 Ultra. But when Apple released the M2 Ultra, all the graphs are going to really point to the M2 Ultra instead of the M1 Ultra. Although, I would still say that if the price is dropping down on the M1 Ultra, that is still a really great machine to get a good price that the graph may goes in both directions. It'll be very interesting to find out. The other thing I also want to share as well is that let's say you have an M2 ship and not the Pro or the Max. You can certainly choose to linear upgrade within the generation. But another thing that I always tell different users to do is that you can always consider upgrading to the previous generation with a higher tier SOC as well. So you can go either to the Max or to the Ultra and that will get you a much better performance than just sometimes linear upgrading within the same generation. So those are just things to really think about when it comes to just upgrading these components. All right, now that we have got the SOC out of the way a little bit, let's talk about SSD. It is the component that you can upgrade in your system and you can always expand that. Now, not internally, especially if you get a desktop or laptop, really doesn't matter, but you can always expand that once you have already configured your computer with an external device, an external hard drive, SSD. You can also use a NAS or even a DAS to link it up to your system and expand the storage pool. So when it comes to SSD, my best recommendation for this is just to really choose the SSD based on what you're going to need now, capacity wise, and what you may need in the future. Don't go and upgrade to the highest tier SSD and spend a lot of money on that just because you want to get the higher speed. Now, one way that you can really get to the higher speed one without spending too much money is upgrading to one terabyte. But if you're really debating whether you should be upgrading the SSD or the RAM on the system, I would highly recommend upgrading RAM first. RAM would be the top priority to upgrade. Then afterwards, you can probably consider upgrading the SSD. And I would say that the silicon will probably be the last thing that you may want to consider upgrade. So for instance, going for from the base M2 Pro to the top M2 Pro SOC for that matter, that will probably be last on my list. If you have extra funding, I would probably put that as the third priority. 
Now, if you really want to find out how fast of an SSD you need to run create a workflow, I made a video specifically talking about that. And the reality of it is you don't need that fast at all because on a daily basis, you're not really going to see any variation whatsoever in the export time, the rendering time, even just you working with the system. And I'll leave a link to this video in the description below. RAM. This is a component in the system that you cannot upgrade. The moment it is configured, it is pretty much just fixed. So you want to configure based on what you really need. So you need to think about how you use your computer. Is this your only one computer? If it is, then you may want to get more RAM. If you have multiple computers, a desktop and a laptop, work modal, then you may be able to configure more RAM on the desktop and have that be the powerful one. And the laptop you take on the road can have less RAM. It just gets the work done, but you don't need the top performing one to be on the road. Think about your workflow really carefully when you're approaching this. The other thing too is think about the way how you work through the program on your computer. Are you the type of person that just launch the computer up, do the tasks that you need to do, shut down the computer, or are you the type that will leave your computer running 24-7? put it to sleep every now and then and have all these app running and have way too many browsers and too many tabs running at the same time. I'm guilty of that. So for me, I would configure my system with more RAM to start out with because I know I'm gonna constantly use that. So you have to think about these things very carefully. I always recommend that for any Creative Pro, if you're really trying to figure out how much memory you need, restart your computer, launch a program called Activity Monitor, go to the memory tab and look at the memory pressure. Based on how much memory you have now, let's say you have a 16 gigabyte memory. When you're running your creative app going through your daily workflow, take a peek every now and then at Activity Monitor and see where your pressure is at. If it's green, you're generally okay with going with 16 again. However, if you're at yellow or you're at red, you definitely want to consider getting more in the system. Now, if you're starting out with 16 to start out with, let's say coming from an Intel machine, it's probably a lot more difficult to decide whether you're gonna to go to like 32 or 64. So one of the ways that you can really look at that as well is to look at the physical memory usage. How much of those memories are you really using in a system right now? And that can be a secondary set of data, although not a definitive one, it will help give you clues whether you should really go in and upgrade to, you know, the top one, like 64 or 96 gigabytes of memory or not. You can see how much is being wired, how much is being used and so forth. And that really gives you a pretty good gauge as to how you may be using your memory. Now, the other way that I really recommend that you do instead is to download this program called ISAT Menu. It is a paid program. They have a trial that you can try. I'm not affiliated with them, but I'll leave a link down to their website in the description below. I love their app because it keeps track of my usage up to 30 days. So I can see the memory pressure, I can see the memory, the processes that are being used and how much is being swapped on the system. And that will give me a really great indicator as much as, as far as how I am using my machine. So those are always great indicators. And I mean, this app is not that expensive at all. I highly think it's worth it. So we're finding out right now, as I've shared in many other different videos that I've created that for each different task that you do in the creative app, they don't always target the same system resources. Let's take Lightroom Classic. Import preview one-to-one -one, or any type of import preview for that matter targets the CPU. When you go into exporting, it takes into account the CPU and also GPU with hardware acceleration. RAM is part of the equation, but it doesn't make that big of a difference. Now, when you're doing panorama merge in Lightroom Classic, it uses a lot of RAM on your system to merge all those files together. So again, each different task that you throw in in the program will target different system resources. So this is part of the thing why I tell people to really think about what your creative workflow is like, what do you do most of, and really configure your workflow based on that. So you're not really going out there and spending the max amount on the machine in order to get one that may fit your workflow even though you may have other components that you're not really using efficiently and effectively. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind too, is that the reason why I say this is because if we have unlimited amount of funding, that would be great, right? I mean, I want to have that. I want to have all the machine configuration to run tests so I can see all the little delineation between machines, but that's just financially impossible and is impossible for me. And I'm sure that for many of us impossible. I don't even configured my machine to like eight terabyte SSD because it's really just not affordable at this point and I can't really justify it in my workflow as much creative work as I'm doing to really pay for that amount of money when it's not really going to make that much of a difference in the workflow that I'm using it in. So for instance, I have a few of these to share with you. A 14 inch MacBook Pro upgrade everything to 96 gigabytes of memory, 
M2 Max 8 terabyte SSD, you're looking at $62.99. When you really start to go in and put all your money into the machine, you can get a really good machine. Don't get me wrong, no doubt. This is gonna be a really great machine, but how much better is it going to be to spend those extra thousand dollars? And how much faster are those tasks going to run if you really think about it? And some tasks, you may not see that much variation whatsoever. For example, a 16 inch MacBook Pro M2 with the top M1 Max chip, you're looking at $6,499, $6,500, 96 gigabytes of memory and eight terabyte SSD. I mean, this is a lot of money. Even the Mac mini, you can really configure this with the M2 Pro, the top one, 32 gigabytes of memory and upgrade this to eight terabyte SSD, you're really looking at about $4,500. So you can spend a lot of money on upgrade. And if you're not using these components, specifically a lot of the reason why many of these machines I'm showing you are really expensive is because the SSD, you're looking at spending around like maybe $2,500 to get to like the eight terabyte. It is a lot of money, including the Mac Studio. If you go in and configure the Mac Studio with the M1 Ultra top spec SOC, 128 gigabytes of memory and eight terabyte SSD, you're looking at $8,000. Now, if you have this kind of money and you can really spend on this, that's fantastic. But I can tell you this, that majority of us, myself included, I'm really constantly looking for how can I get the best performance out of the machine with spending the least amount of money. So anyway, I hope that you find this guide on how to configure your Apple Silicon computer helpful at least gives you an overview for the idea. And if you wanna see any of the machine performance, how they perform against each other, the M1, M2 generation, the different chip configurations, what I would do is I would check out the other videos that I have made specifically on those topics. I'll leave links to them or many of them in the description below so you can definitely check that out. Anyway, hope you find that helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below, give this a like, subscribe and hit the bell, and I'll be trust.